Hello YouTube. Hi. Uh, today I'm going to do a my list for the top 11 one day international players uh, ever to play from all around the world. So first off I'm just going to list them and uh, number one is uh, Adam Gilchrist from Australia. Now he's my opening batsman and he's also my wicket keeper. Now I consider him to be the best wicket keeper ever to play the game also for chess and for one day internationals probably would have been for t20s except for he didn't really play them very much in one day internationals he was number one best batsman for long periods of time as well as being a fantastic wicket keeper and look he started off he was having to compete with ian healy so uh, i think he averaged about 36 strike rate about 96 during a time when most people were 30 average and 70 strike rate and for him to have a phenomenal strike rate during that time and also a better than average average you've got to tip your hat off to that fantastic player and he also took more dismissals per match than anyone else and he's second on the all-time dismissals list behind kumar sangakara who played a lot more matches almost double the matches and just barely more um, dismissals so my tip number one adam gilchrist from australia Okay, number two is Brian Lara. Now that's West Indies. A lot of people don't realise just how good he was in one day internationals. Uh, he was number one for six years in a row, which is the longest period in a row of any player in history. And he opened the batting most of the time. Now, there are a lot of other players we could have considered, but he's, you know, he's my other opening batsman. Uh, a lot Really underrated as an opening batsman. If you ever saw him play and you saw what he was capable of, he was a one-man army and he won a lot of matches for West Indies by himself with a team that was either not concentrating or just not very highly skilled compared to their opposition. Uh, Brian Lara just flogged everybody. Just, you know, if he was there, West Indies were going to win. And um, that was, it was the best one-man army going. There were a few other teams with one-man armies. Brian Lara was the number one one-man army. And number three, another West Indian, Sir Vivian Richards. Don't need to say a lot more about him. Average was around about 50 and his strike rate was 90. And this was during a time when most people struggled to strike at 50. So during that time, this is the late 1970s, early 1980s, most people started opening the bats batting. And for the first 30 or so overs, they just accumulated going at maybe three runs and over. And then towards the end, last 15 or 20 overs, if you have wickets in hand, you'd go at six and over. But he would go six and over from the start. I mean, maybe that's because West Indies were just so much better than everybody else at that time. But nobody else in West Indies was doing it. It was just him. And he was just miles ahead of everybody else. And not just, he was miles ahead of everybody else on his own team. And he was miles ahead of anyone else on any other team. And it's no surprise that he has the longest period of time. He's number one batsman. And it was around about seven years. It wasn't all in a row, but seven years out of about 12, he was number one. And the times that he wasn't number one, he wasn't far off it. Just phenomenal. You've got to put him in the team. It's number three. Number four, I've got Virat Kohli. Uh, it's India. Now, Virat Kohli, a lot of people might be surprised. I've put him ahead of Sachin Tendulkar. Now, I like Sachin Tendulkar as a person. I like Virat Kohli as a player. Hate playing against him. Hated playing against Viv Richards. Hated playing against Brian Lara. They're they're, uh, they're not very nice people, uh, at least from their public image. But for Rat Coley, you can't argue with runs, and he's just phenomenal. I mean, you know, when he started off, he was a fringe player. Ended up just absolutely dominating, and you can see, you know, until he's out, you, you're like, you, you're just scared. You just think, well. They can just get any runs. They'll never get out, and they'll get it to go at any rate. And even though he, he often, like his strike rate wasn't that high, but it's still high enough. You know, he, he just had that 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 ferocity about him. And, I mean, I used to have Dean Jones in my 11, and he's an Australian, but I, I had to replace him with Rat Coley because Coley is that much that good. Dean Jones himself was number one for three years, but Rat Coley, you know, He's just been ridiculous. And, and I think even with all of the different things we've got to say about how easy it is to bet today, how small the grounds are, how much they've changed the rules, we're at Coley, lock for me. All right, now number five, 
AB de Villiers, Abraham, Benjamin de Villiers, about 150 or 50 balls, what can you say? And he was consistent, and he was consistent. No, he didn't always get 150 or 50, but he was consistently good. Now, even sometimes he'd get 30 or 50 or 20 or 40. But as the game required, he would do as the game required. So I've got AB de Villiers in there. I mean, you want to have your solid batsman up there, but he can just absolutely go for it. And in a, in a pinch, he can keep your wickets too. Um, he may have ended up being better than Gilchrist as a wicket keeper, but, you know, he didn't get to do it very much because Mark Boucher was there. Mark Boucher, fantastic wicket keeper there as well. Not much behind uh, Gilchrist. I put, I put Boucher as the number two best wicket keeper of all time. And A.B. de Villiers didn't get to keep because he was behind uh, Boucher. So that, that's saying something. That, that's what it requires to keep de Villiers out. And, you know, he's in my team, you know, as a batsman. What a great achievement for him, unable to keep wickets. And he could have played soccer. He could have uh, been a runner, I believe. And I think he might have even been rugby. But anyway, we've got him in cricket. Aren't we lucky? So he's in my team. Number six, Michael Bevan. Oh, what more can you say? If, if you are keeping him out, I'm going to suggest you never saw him play. Because if you saw him play, you'd know what he could do. I mean, he's a player you want in any side, in every side, all the time. Because he was your insurance policy. Essentially, everything goes wrong, Bevan will make it right. And that was what happened. So a lot of the time, you say, oh, geez, he didn't get that many man of the match awards. He's still got quite a lot. But um, he just came in there and you're facing, you've got eight wickets down for 100. You're chasing 210 to win. He'll get you there. Don't worry about that. And he just knew how to farm the strike while still scoring at a good rate. He knew how to maximise your chances of victory. Now, it wasn't a guarantee. It was pretty close. And he had all those numbers going in his head. He knew, all right, I'll go three and over here, farm the strike, one and over, two and over, six and over, ten and over, twenty and over. And people say, well, his, his overall economy rate, was a, his strike rate was a bit low. It wasn't actually that low for the time. Um, but he could score really quickly when he needed to. We saw there was a World Eleven match. He scored 150 of 120 balls to win the match, and he could do that if he needed to. He just didn't need to very often. It wasn't appropriate. I mean, if there'd been a situation where Australia were, let's say, five for 150, needing 300 to win, and there's only 20 overs to go, he would have gone for it. But we just weren't in that situation very often, and more often we were eight for 100, chasing 200, and and you know it, it needed someone to just be there and. Bevan was your guy to be there. He's your insurance policy. If everything goes wrong, he's who you have. Boom. And he's Australian. Great player. And he was world number one for uh, just over three years. So, you know, he had that pedigree. And he was number two behind Brian Lara for another four or five years. So, you know, very, very good for a very, very long time. Number seven, Shahid Afridi. Now, He's not there for his batting, I'll just say that. His batting was very inconsistent. It was more down than up. A lot of people call him duck free. But as a bowler, very consistent, very good, and one of the very best uh, spin bowlers out there. And to have somebody there that was mercurial as a batsman, and as, as mercurial as he was, um, was just phenomenal. Uh, the Sanath Jayasariya and perhaps the Lance Kluzner were just as mercurial with batting. It was a bit, bit more consistent too, but... They didn't bowl as well. And to have a Freedy there as your regular fifth bowler and to occasionally be able to get you those big wins. So, you you know, I'm talking about Michael Bevan, how he can, he can get you 100 runs with the last two wickets. A Freedy could get 100 runs off your last six overs. And that's, that's if, if you're in that sort of desperate situation, you need to up the ante, you need to have it roll the dice. Freddie's one of them players you could just throw in there. And I love to have a player like that in my World Eleven. So Pakistan's uh, Shahid Afridi, who's, I think it was his second match, he broke the world record for the fastest century. And he broke it a couple of more times after that too. Just ridiculous. Just, uh, he's a fantastic player and, you know, deserves to be in the world team. Okay, so number eight, I'm putting in, uh, well, I'll put in Shane Warne. So I'm putting him in there a little bit higher in the batting order. He liked to bat a bit higher up. Number eight's his spot. So Shane Warne, uh, his bowling record, you could argue that others have got better bowling record. But Shahid, uh, Shane, 
Shane Warren, I was from Australia, he was uh, very good at, at winning matches when they shouldn't be able to be won. And it wasn't just his bowling. He knew, like he had it in his head, a bit like uh, Michael Bevan, had it in his head what you need to do to win. And he showed this in the one-day internationals more than in tests. He did in tests too, but he just go. Uh, there was a one. Uh, which World Cup was it? Possibly 2003 or 2007. One of them. And he just went there, and Australia were in a bit of trouble. This was like, well, put some fieldsmen out there, do this, put this player on, get this player bowling, do all this, do all this. Boom, we win. You know, other people would be just giving up, and he just knew how to do it. So you got these match winners. And this is what I'm saying. You've got your Michael Bevins, you've got your uh, Shahida Freedy, you've got your Shane Warnes. Different sort of players, but match winners. And when you're down and out, when you're losing, these are the sort of players that are going to get you back in there. So you want to have Shane Warne on your side. All right, number nine uh, was an Akram. Now, great bowler. Could bat a bit sometimes too. Now, you've got a double century in a test match once. He could bat. He just didn't very often show it. That's because it wasn't needed. But, look, he was, he was a very, very, very good bowler. And left-armed, you know, you, you, you're going to get a lot of wickets there. And fast, he could reverse swing, do the in-swingers, do Yorkers, do whatever you wanted. You could be defending two runs off the last over. They could have five wickets in hand. You give him the ball. And look, every so often he's going to win it for you. It, you know, not every time. But, um, you know, you, you're going you're gonna to have him there. He'll be putting his heart and soul in it, into it. And a great player from Pakistan, uh, the second Pakistani player, great bowler. Number 10, Wakar Yunus, probably the fastest bowler, I mean, fastest good bowler. There were a few erratic fast bowlers going around, but fa uh, fast, quick bowler, and also from Pakistan. And he actually bowled with Wasn Akram. Wow, they were amazing together. And sometimes they had a good third fast bowler and even a fourth fast bowler to go with them. And, you would just be terrified of them. Waka Yunus was raw pace, a lot of control, and he would just get the wickets out and on the right on the right conditions. He just knew what to do. He could bounce you, he could york you, he could tempt you, he could tie you up, he just, you know, wrap you up in, in ribbons and send you off to the post office for Christmas present. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know where I got that from, but uh, that's what Waka is. I mean, him and Wasn Akram, probably the two best uh, one-day international bowlers. So there you go. Now, number 11, uh, I have gone with Glenn McGrath from Australia. Now, McGrath, his record in one-day internationals was phenomenal. That was where he started before he became a good uh, test bowler. Didn't play that many one-days because they just kept leaving it out, him out. But in the end, and there were a couple of World Cups there where he just – He'd, he'd force batsmen to give him, get out or make a day to have a choice. You don't score any runs. Well, I'm going to get your wicket. You try to score a run, I'll take your wicket. And he just hypnotised them. You give me your wicket. And look, he wasn't the only bowler to do that. I think uh, Courtney Walsh did that a little bit. And to a small extent, even Shane Warne did that. But... McGrath was the best at hypnotising. He just bowled line and length. And there are other bowlers, they bowled possibly just as well, but he just had that intimidation factor about him that there's just an air about him and you just go, and you just you just get out to him. So that's my 11. Um, so as a recap, I've got number one is Australia's Adam Gilchrist, also the wicketkeeper. Number two is Brian Lara. From West Indies. Number three, Viv Richards, also from West Indies. Number four, Virat Kohli from India. Number five, A.B. De Villiers from South Africa. Number six, Michael Bevan from Australia. Number seven, Shahidi Fridi from uh, Pakistan. Number eight, uh, Shane Warne from Australia. Number nine, got Wazam Makran from Pakistan. Number 10, Waka Yunus from Pakistan. And number 11, Glenn McGrath from Australia. Now, my number 12th man, I've got Natalia Morali Duran from Sri Lanka. Now, one of the reasons to leave him as 12th man is because I feel that having three fast bowlers and two spin bowlers is the right combination. I think if we change it to two fast and three spin, you're going to have a bit too much spin. But on the right conditions, you could put Morley in there. You might even consider putting him in, the, him in there instead of Shahida Fridi for a bit more oomph with your spin bowling, but you're losing a bit of batting. Depends on the situation. So 
that's my team. Uh, I know I've missed out a lot of players that a lot of play, people like. Um, there's a number of reasons for it, but look, if you want to have your own team, you can have your own team. That's my team. I'm Australian. I've been following cricket since 1982, and I didn't miss that much of the one-day experience. I did miss a little bit at the start, but I did, did watch a lot of old videos, so I think I've seen pretty much every match ever played. So uh, that's my opinion. I uh, hope it's not too inaccurate. I think it's fair enough as far as I'm concerned to have a few Australians in there. They did really well for a long time. I only got four. So uh, you'll find a lot of other people will be a lot more biased towards their own country. I'm trying to be uh, very accurate and unbiased, and that's my team. All right, hope you like it. And um, see you, YouTube, and let me know if you have your own teams and who you'd be putting in there. I'm sure every person on the planet will have their own team. That's just how it goes. Um, but I hope you do appreciate what I've got there. So, all right, see you then, YouTube. Bye.